That for me, my arthritic finger. That's good. Thanks. Yeah, got it. Ready? <laughs> oh God, this is actually right there, isn't it? <laughs> is everybody good? Everybody ready? All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming again. This to our uh, lecture series for part of the Berryville 2 25th year long celebration. This is the last of the March lecture series, and today we're going to look at the history and evolution of Clark County Schools with three amazing people. I think you're going to have some fascinating stories that we're going to, you're going to hear today. My name is Nathan Stalvey. I am the director of the Clark County Historical Association, and I've been moderating these talks for the month. And a big shout out to the Barnes and Rose Hill for hosting these talks and all of you for coming out to these. These have been very good, very unique insights into different aspects of Clark County's history. And we appreciate you coming out. Please visit the Barnes and Rose Hill um, on their website, as well as the Clark County Historical Association. We have a lot of great events coming up. We also have, we're also looking for volunteers. Um, we also, Clark County Historical Association, our Art at the Mill show is coming up. So if you're looking to buy some local arts, definitely come out for that. It opens up April 22nd. And a big shout out to the Berryville 225th Commission for working very tirelessly to come up with some ideas for programs throughout the year. And be sure to follow them on social media, on Facebook, and to see what's coming up next. So uh, as we get into this talk, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. We have John McEwen, former principal of Boyce Elementary School. We have Brenda Jones, former principal of D.G. Cooley Elementary School. And we have Bill Overby, former assistant superintendent of schools for Clark County. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. And uh, as we start, I guess, let's start with hearing a little bit about you and a little bit about your background and what brought you to Clark County. Well, uh, a job brought me to Clark County. I, I had been a, a high school principal in Southside, Virginia, and, and this looked like a pretty good place. So that's what brought me here in 1966. Okay, um, my parents brought me here. And at the time I wasn't real happy because I was in high school and I was just starting my sophomore year. So of course I left all my friends behind coming to a new school with a different type of dynamics that was going on at the time, which we share a little bit later. But um, they brought me here because my father was from Clark County, my mother was from Winchester. Prior to that, we had lived in uh, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, um, all of my life up until then. My wife brought me here <laughs> um, in a roundabout way. We were um, we met in um, Okinawa while we were teaching at a school there, 
and were married and um, came here and were headed, uh, came to Winnie's home and uh, Annandale. And um, we um, were headed to North Africa then because I was already committed to a school there. And um, eventually we uh, wanted to settle close to Winnie's mom and dad in Annandale and the farther west we came, the better we liked it. <laughs> Nice. Well, I, I join you. I'm also. I was also brought here. The job brought me here, like you. So, for non-Clark uh, not people not born in Clark County, I'm gonna say it's amazing. <laughs> so, um, so you all came to Clark County at let's we'll say an, an interesting time, and in not only in the county's history but in the nation's history as well. Uh, before we start looking at some of the larger items, first. The buildings, the school buildings at the time that you arrived were very different as they are now. Tell us a little bit about your memories of the schools when you first got here. And we're talking like the buildings mostly. Well, the middle school was the high school. Uh, the school, uh, uh, Cooley School had, was built in 1967. That was my first year. We moved in on a Sunday. I left Sunday school and went and moved furniture into the building. The cafeteria was not finished. The principal's office was not finished. Each room was independent with the heating and cooling. So we started school without the, the, a cafeteria. People brought their bag lunches just like they did for uh, several hundred years, and it worked okay. And uh, they eventually got the, the school completed, of course. And uh, Johnson Williams School was, was, was inter integrated in 1966, and uh, it would was renamed Clark County Intermediate School. The black community came to the school board and asked them to change the name back to Johnson Williams, which they did, which is what it's called today. Right. And of course, it was boys' school there. And the old boy, uh, El Bearville Elementary School, which is next to the school board office, it's a parking lot now, was there. But it was uh, had, had lots of deficiencies and wasn't suitable for remodeling. So we built Cooley School, right. Okay, when my parents brought me to Virginia, to Clark County, um, the first school that I was enrolled in was Johnson Williams uh, School, high school. Um, and at that time, they were just making the transition from segregated schools to integrated schools. And so my mother enrolled three of us in Johnson Williams, um, and I attended school there for a year. Um, it was a much smaller school than what I was accustomed to. The schools that I went to were very large and very diverse. Um, so I was at Johnson Williams for one year, and then my mother wrote a letter to the school board requesting that my sister, who was just starting school, and I be transferred to the Clark County, um, um, uh, Clark County Schools. Um, and then um, I finished out my last two years of high school at Clark County High School, and my sister started um, Boyce Elementary School that year. And we were always, we, living in the city, we would walk to school. There were no school buses, so my first experience with a school bus was coming to Clark County. And so we rode school buses. That was an experience, too. <laughs> <laughs> when I came to um, uh, Virginia, uh, Winnie and I uh, were with my mom and uh, mother and father-in-law in Annandale. And um, when I uh, came to finally arrived at Boyce, uh, Boyce was using a building that was built in 1942. And um, um, I was very fortunate to come uh, and be connected to this county and the school system at that time because um, uh, the uh, first principal of that building was Buddy Neff, and he was still alive. And we, we used to have a great time visiting uh, there was another principal from um, Clark County that um, moved on to Fairfax County at one point, but um, he um, he uh, was principal at Boyce for five years at, during his t uh, teaching experience or 
administrative experience. So the building that um, um, that uh, I f first became familiar with was the building that is now at Boyce under a remodeled um, condition. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, Brendan, I'd like to go back to you for a second. You had mentioned that you moved here from Pennsylvania your sophomore year, mm -hmm. and then you basically had to go to two different schools during your – so you had an interesting high school – you know, you know, high school life, three different schools, two locations, having to adjust to not only just a new, completely new state and new friends and things like that. What were some of those challenges like? Tell us a little bit about like how you adjusted to that. It was an interesting adjustment. <laughs> First, all my friends were left behind, and then you come in. And when you're in high school, you make new friends, but then um, those friendships kind of start off slowly because you didn't grow up with everybody, and you kind of see the bond that the kids had that grew up with each other. And so that was pretty interesting. Um, but it felt different. I, I, the one thing that I remember all the time was asking, why is it like this? Why is it like this? Why is it like this? And if I read stories to kids in school today about segregation, same thing. Why was it like that? Why was it like that? So I just really didn't understand the principle behind it at the time, but I know I didn't like it. And so uh, going from school to school, it was, it was very different. Of course, I met different people and I made new friends, but it didn't feel like home, like growing up in a school with all your friends and everybody, and and you know everybody, and things were just quite different then. Um, um, the facilities were different. Um, I think expectations were different. I know in Johnson Williams, they had high expectations for all kids. But it wasn't quite that way when you made the transfer during the time of, of uh, integration. Um, I didn't feel like we were pushed the way we were pushed in the, in the black schools when they knew that education was everything and you really had to get a good quality education in order to go places. So we didn't still have that push going on at that time between in the 60s. It, was, it just wasn't there. People were getting used to each other. Some people felt comfortable with it, with the integration. Some people were not comfortable with integration. That's students and adults. So you got that feel too. So the atmosphere was very different in all three, in both places. That's a great segue into the, the next question. And um, as I had mentioned, all three of you were at the schools in Clark County at a, at a very important time in, in this country's history. And one of the items, when I first started working here at Clark County Historical Association, one of the items that I saw on display at the Josephine School Community Museum here in Berryville, they have a copy of a letter that was sent to the parents in 1966, in June of 1966, saying the schools are integrating, you have 30 days to decide where your child is going to school. So let's focus a little bit first, because I do want to talk about what were how did some of the parents handle this you know both from as a, as an administrator as a teacher as a student but before we get to that what was it like leading up to that and we, we, everybody knew that brown versus board of education had been decided and what was this a slow process or did this suddenly just ramp up very quickly integration is what i'm talking about did this start happening really quickly almost overnight or was this a slow build up and what was it like prior to officially being integrated? Well, the Supreme Court said that uh, schools would, would uh, integrate with all deliberate speed. That was that terminology, whatever that meant. That was in 1954. And uh, deliberate speed in Clark County was 12 years later. Uh, but but mm -hmm. uh, some places were integrated before that, some school systems and some after that. So, no, it was a pretty slow process, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there, there was a, 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 an organization called Massive Resistance in Virginia that kept trying to hold it back. You know, it's kind of like holding back a tide. You can't hold it back, but they did, they did try, right? Mm 
but didn't work. Yeah. John, I'm going to tell you, John is a guy who grew up in West Texas, and he's had a lot of experience that we have him uh, teaching in uh, Africa, Okinawa, uh, and places like that. So maybe he could tell you how it was when you were coming along, John. Right. I can't think of anything that would be outstanding except one thing that really uh, to this day sticks to my mind. When we first came here, <clears throat> Winnie uh, was home with our youngest, and um, uh, she was going to the bank and going to the service station and doing things that she had time to do then. And um, one evening, she, she told me, and this was soon after we got here, uh, she said, uh, you know, I really would not want to be a black person in this county. And this was just looking on as sort of an outsider coming in and seeing the way the interaction was at that time. Mm -hmm. I think that has improved probably greatly since then. Mm -hmm. So what integration comes along, it's 1966. Tell us a little bit about the school year from your perspectives, that school year, 66, 67. What was that school year like? Once integration was in place, you had mentioned some of the resistance. What was it like from your perspectives in the schools? Well, now, this resistance was not necessarily local. That was a state statewide, right? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. right. That's where the term "massive resistance" came from. Mm -hmm. But from your perspectives within the schools, that academic year, tell us a little bit about what that academic year was like. Well, these guys were right in the building, so I let them speak. <laughs> Um, even though students were invited to transfer before 66, and there were some African-American students, from my understanding, that transferred over to uh, the white school. We had, uh, from what I understand, there were high school students and there were some elementary schools that transferred the year before, 66, 67, which was my, mm, my age, which was my class. <laughs> and that was the total integration during that time. And um, I really don't remember any kind of preparation for the change. Um, oh, I was already over there. But I didn't realize any, any preparation for the change of all the students coming together in one school. Um, growing up in Pennsylvania, I only went to diverse schools. We had kids from all walks of life in the schools I attended. And then it was a big deal for this change to happen in 66 and 67. So again, some people were comfortable with it, students and teachers, and I imagine parents as well. Um, but it was awkward and a little uncomfortable. We knew we had to go to school. We knew we had to learn. We knew we had teachers there who wanted us there. We knew we had teachers there that weren't excited about us being there. We just had to move through the maze and do it the best way we knew how. I said, when I graduated from high school, I was leaving. I was never coming back because it wasn't positive for me. However, I never left Clark County. <laughs> became a part of the school system for 38 years. <laughs> and so um, there had to be some good things going on for me. Well, I married someone from Clark County. I guess that's what kept me here, because I was out of here. But um, for the most part, um, you made the best out of a situation that wasn't so great for kids at that time. Mm -hmm. That's the way it, that's what it all boils down to. And you have, you know, your parents stress education, so you knew you, that was your job. You had to get up and go to school to get an education. Mm -hmm. John, how about your perspective at uh, Boyce Elementary at the time? We had <clears throat> a great um, population there. Uh, the... Uh, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven when I came across boys' school. Um, we had um, uh, just a wonderful uh, atmosphere, I felt, in that school. The parents, 
that would knock themselves out to do whatever we needed to do at school if they could do help. Um, and that was black folks, white folks, red, yellow, everyone. It, it was just, uh, I didn't live through that period that uh, these folks did mm -hmm. here in this area. And uh, uh, I've been very pleased. My best friend was Brenda's husband, and um, we we just had a great time. What years were you at Boyce Elementary School? Nineteen. Let's see. Um, Seventy six was my first year. I I was teaching in Herndon because. Um, um, we did not know where we wanted to settle down, and uh, so I went ahead and uh, applied for a position uh, there in Fairfax County while we were with um, Winnie's mom and dad. And so um, uh, when we found uh, this piece of property that we now live on uh, and purchased it, uh, I was still teaching in Herndon, and uh, I contacted uh, uh, Mr. Overby, as a matter of fact, to, uh, at one time, and there were no openings uh, available here. And um, <clears throat> in 1978, um, by golly, I got a call from the superintendent's office that uh, uh, Mr. Johnson, the superintendent, would like to t uh, meet with me uh, because I, I, he had seen my application that I'd left uh, uh, with the school system. And um, so, uh, um, I arranged to um, meet with Mr. Johnson and come to find out uh, the principal at uh, Boyce Elementary, Mr. Naff, uh, was having some health issues, had been there several years, and was planning on retiring. And um, that's how I ended up there. Interesting. So, uh, Mr. Excuse me. I, yes. think, I think Clark County citizens, black and white, did a pretty good job mm -hmm. of, of making the change over, unlike... Uh, like Warren County, which closed oh, the schools totally for different. four yeah. or five years. And some of the students uh, who were in the Warren County High School came to Clark County High School to, to graduate. Can, I think there's a, and that's a story I think a lot of people don't realize is Warren County's response was pretty <laughs> extreme. Uh, can you elaborate, for those who don't know, can you tell a little bit about like how that was very different? You'd said that the schools closed rather right. than integrate. Right. Would they, was it also, I'd heard that like. The, the black kids were bust across the mountain over to, I think, the Culpeper County for this right. school. You know, the, you pass the mm -hmm. local high school to go to your school 40 miles away, something like that. Hmm. Some of the students <clears throat> came to Clark County schools. Those, these are some of the stories that I heard, and I was amazed that students from Warren County, when they closed the schools, had to go different places. Yeah. Some even came to Clark County schools um, at Johnson Williams and went to school there for I don't know how long, but they did. Wow. That's just so... Yeah, Clark's response wasn't quite that extreme, so that's good. <laughs> so, well, there's, there's more to the uh, history of the school <laughs> systems here than just that, that period of time. Mm -hmm. If you really want to know what's going on or what went on, go to the school board office and get some of the old minutes. Mm. And for instance, mm. one of them I read, uh, they used to have a lot of little small one-room schools around the county. Mm -hmm. And and one one time the uh, uh, minutes showed that the school board voted to buy a broom for the school over on the mountain. Uh, just that was one item on that thing was to buy a br one broom, which is... Uh, <laughs> but, that's the, that's the way that things were in those days. Uh, they wrote everything and down. There's also a book, if it's still there, in the Clark County uh, School Board office, that a lady here wrote a history of the Clark County schools up until about 1940 or so. Mm -hmm. And she also happened to be on the State Board of Education. So if, if you can find that, that's pretty interesting reading as well. Mm. Yes. Uh, I might mention that um, my wife... Uh, uh, went to Longwood College, and uh, she did her student teaching uh, before graduating there. And um, the county where Longwood is located uh, was uh, segregated. And uh, so the student teachers had to go to some other county uh, to do their student teaching. Oh, interesting. And so um, uh, my wife was the one that was driving the car for this group of 
teachers to go to their uh, uh, teaching positions for their student teaching. And um, uh, the, uh, the uh, class before them had missed a snow day. And so here uh, on the way to their teaching position, uh, she was um, so worked up about, they were, they were so uh, angry at having to make up time that those other uh, student teachers had uh, missed mm. that uh, she got a speeding ticket. <laughs> but um, she um, had to leave that county or they had to leave that county in order to go uh, participate in their um, student teaching activities. Mm. Goodness. Yeah, that, that's where oh, I keep bringing the same subject up. It, that was Prince Edward County, mm -hmm. and that's where it, it started. In 1951 or two, the kids at the, uh, the black high school, I walked out of the building. They, I would you call it on strike, if you would. They got the principal somehow out of the building because he would have stopped it. But uh, they got him away and went on, on strike. Uh, I was living in Farmville, the town at the time, and, and they, they integrated the, uh, uh, the uh, Longwood College mm -hmm. and let men go there uh, after World War II. That's, that's a whole other story. So I was living there taking some classes, not even aware of what was going on in that part of the, of the town. But uh, they, they had terrible buildings, just terrible buildings, and that, they wanted newer buildings. The NAACP came in and said, we'll support you, but you'll have to have full integration. If you want to go to the, the, have the same buildings that the white kids have, you go to school with the white kids. So that's what we started, and that's where it started. And schools all around, not all around the state, but in some places, closed their schools and started private schools, and some of them are still operating. Prince yes. Edward County started its own, Brunswick County, and some of the others in the southeastern part of the state. The people in the valley... If you go back and read the newspapers for 1860, they were not necessarily in favor of, of uh, leaving the Union. They, they didn't have uh, plantations for mm -hmm. corn, tobacco, and rice that took a lot of labor. Uh, so they, had, they didn't have a dog in that fight, so to speak. So they were, they were opposed to, to uh, dropping out of the Union. The school you mentioned, the Moton School, is now, for those of you who don't know, is now a museum down in Farmville. They've actually turned the school into a museum to tell that story. Uh, it's a fascinating museum. It's uh, anybody ever gets a chance to go to Farmville, it's great exhibits, a great video that recreates the student walkout. It was all student led, and it's a, which I think is pretty fascinating. Um, the then this might be a, a better question for you, Mr. Overby is. During this time, what were some of the challenges with parents and teachers? Uh, I know I interviewed somebody years ago who was a teacher at Johnson Williams, who was also a football coach, a successful football coach, and then he went to go teach at Clark County High School, and he was basically an assistant to an assistant coach. And anytime he had some ideas to improve the team, he was often, no, no, you're, you don't know what you're talking about. We know just you know, know your place almost. So what were some of the challenges of teachers and parents that, that you were hearing at the time? Say the question again, challenges of yes. what? Yes, challenges uh, during, you know, right, you know, during integration, what were some of the challenges and some well, of those? Brenda, I mentioned it, uh, neither, neither side, if you will, had any kind of preparation of how to respond or react. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, White teachers had been calling boys boy for years. You know, it was just something you call a, a kid. But in the black community, that was a term meant for maybe a slave when everybody was called boy. I mean, I don't know that, but that's what I've heard. So we had we had no preparation for for cultures integrating uh, and what what gives and what doesn't give, what you can say, what you can't say. So that was that was one of the. Uh, challenges and uh, one of our local schools not in this county uh, had a I can't it, it's a race riot there's no nicer word to put to it and the person that told me that uh, it was a, a black assistant principal at the school but the thing that got them together was athletics the kids were playing football they wanted to play and and the school had shut down for a few days 
till things quieted down. And, and they had these little groups around town that met, I think, and talked things over. But the athletic teams was, was what kind of got that back together. Can I add something? Um, yes. Getting back to 66, 67, mm -hmm. um, when we had total integration, I have to mention the name of Raymond Radcliffe, who was the principal of the black school at the time of integration, who later became the Title I coordinator at the um, at central office. Um, he basically took the black students in the senior class under his wings, and he monitored us and watched over us during that year because that year was not a very easy year. Um, and he would take us to colleges and universities and campuses when he was out in the field working. And um, when I mean field, I mean going out to visit other, you know, go to the State Department, things like that. Um, he would take uh, several of us as, uh, that were seniors, and he would take us to colleges and universities and um, introduce us to campuses and um, take us to the finance department to let us know that there were scholarships available, grants available. We didn't know any of that, and we were not invited to participate at the time in conversations going on about that, but they were having them, but we just didn't have that privilege at that time. So that was another difficult part for seniors graduating during that year at the time of integration. Um, but thanks to him, many of us were able to um, go to college because he supported us and, and worked with us and nurtured us and got us to where he thought we should be, which was a great thing. And for many of us, I was one of them, first year, gen first generation college. Didn't know a lot about it because my parents didn't go. There were five kids, so they really thought it was out of reach for them. But thanks to Mr. Ratcliffe, he taught us all that the reach was for us as well. So we have to give him credit for that. Nice. Uh, Raymond, every day Raymond Radcliffe got up, uh, he was thinking about how he could improve somebody else's life, and it didn't make any difference what color you were. Mm -hmm. He would tr try to help you, he, and he yeah. did a, a, a lot for these kids. Was, he was a great example, nice. and and uh, he uh, it, he would uh, give up a, a, a black kid or a white kid down in the country if they weren't uh, <laughs> behaving themselves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, do, so um, John, you, Mr. McEwen, you had talked about like by 1976 that when you were working at Boyce Elementary School, things were doing great. The parents were together. Uh, the kids got along. That it was this really nice atmosphere. So we're talking not. I mean, it's only 10 years after the school was integrated. And this is a question for all three of you. I guess is when did you feel that things you would mentioned that sports helped kind of bring people together, but when did you feel that things started to, all the challenges from that, from integration in 66, when you feel that some of those tensions started to simmer down and carry on to where it gets to a point where the schools are a little bit more like you experienced when you first came to boys? I felt that uh, uh, we really had a good relationship with uh, everyone there at Boys School. Mm -hmm. I was so pleased. Uh, it was just, well, like I say, I just thought I'd died and gone to heaven whenever I found Boys School. <laughs> it was a wonderful community, supportive parents, mm -hmm. great teachers. Brenda was a <laughs> kindergarten teacher. Yeah, I was one of your teachers. <laughs> in in, in 18, 1860, Clark County was population was probably fifty percent black. Now it's probably five percent or four percent, mm -hmm. um, and, and and that changes things too. Whether you, whichever way you want it to go, mm -hmm. but uh, things do do have yeah. changed there. Yeah. The the population of Clark County, the people came over the mountain, the landed gentry, so to speak, and they brought their slaves with them. People that settled in Frederick County and Shenandoah, they were uh, Pennsylvania Dutch or whatever, and they didn't have slaves. And uh, Clark County was unique in that way. That's true. Um, what kept you, Hall? None of you were from Clark County originally. What kept you in Clark County? 
after all this time? Was it the people, the schools? What did, and everybody stayed in within working within the school district. What about the Clark County Schools kept you here? My wife and I lived in Berryville for forty five years until we had to move to a place that had one floor had too many steps when you get old. And she said it was the happiest 45 years of her life. Uh, she was a big volunteer here and helping in, in this facility as well. And I think she, we, we were both from small towns and, and uh, grew up in small towns and felt very comfortable here. It was a great, and still is as far as I'm concerned, a great place to be. I um, have been a, was a part of the school system for 38 years, um, never wanting to be a teacher, but somehow that was my calling. Um, I needed a job, and I got a job in Clark County Schools at Berryville Primary as a teaching assistant. And I was there for, I did that for like five years. And again, Mr. Raymond Radcliffe went out and found a program for paraprofessionals and veterans that would pay for you to go to school for your education. And he got all of the teaching assistants in Clark County schools in that program. And if they wanted to stay, they could stay and finish out that program and then move on to a degree program. Um, so I was a paraprofessional, finished out that program, and then got a job as a um, teacher um, at Bearville Primary. Um, Mr. Overby hired me, and um, my ex was also working at the time, so there was this conflict of whether I could work under him as a teacher with him being a principal, so we had to work with that. Mr. I remember our talk, Mr. Overby, about that, which I thought was grossly unfair. <laughs> <laughs> at the time, I figured I could work anywhere, you know, women's rights, we could work anywhere we want to work if we were qualified, right? But back then, it was a little different. But nevertheless, my experience as a teaching assistant was very good, and I, there were opportunities. That's one thing I think is, is really good about being in Clark County Schools and, and being a part of it. There were many opportunities to grow professionally, and I stayed for 38 years, and I worked as a paraprofessional, then moved to teacher, to assistant principal, and the principal. So... I did all of that in Clark County and with the support of Clark County Schools. So um, I think that's another reason why I stayed here. Um, not just that I got married and raised my son here, but because there were opportunities to grow professionally in this school division. And I was, I'm, I'm forever grateful for that. And I tell young people today that, you know, if you think you can't get there, just talk to some people because there's always a way. And for me, it was through the Clark County Public Schools. One of my best days' work was getting these two guys on board here, as well as some <laughs> others out in the audience as well. <laughs> Ms. McEwen, what kept you here? <laughs> Wife and youngsters. <laughs> and just a wonderful experience. Um, uh, like I say, died and gone to heaven and right there in boys' school. Um, and um, had some great uh, mentors too, I would, I would say, uh, fellows that had uh, been connected with boys' school in some way or another. Uh, Bud Miley, the first principal there at uh, the building that is still there, uh, was the uh, principal uh, of the uh, building before that, that had been condemned, and um, and um, uh, I didn't have to go through what he had. Uh, he had youngsters, uh, after the building was condemned, he told me he had youngsters in five different locations. He had the primary school and um, uh, the Duck Pond, which was about a mile down the, the road from Boyce in one direction toward Winchester. He had another group of youngsters at the church in Berryville, or, or in Boyce there, and he had kids in um, the little red schoolhouse. So <laughs> during that transition, uh, he had a heck of a time keeping tabs on everything. Uh, I've had none of that. <laughs> I came in, and everything was spread out for me. It was just wonderful. A great well, one, faculty. One thing that's happened uh, here, uh, Nathan, is uh, when I came to Clark County in 1966, 
uh, we had more students in schools than we had last year, for instance, here, this year, mm -hmm. over and, uh, 50 years or whatever that is. And, uh, and we did not have a kindergarten and we did not have special education. So the, the school population really changed. In fact, they haven't used Cooley School for two or three years now, but I noticed mm -hmm. the paper, they got a little large enrollment, so they plan to open that building back up. It's a good thing to have it. When but, I was at Cooley, we had 11 trailers. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Because our population was that big. Right. Well, that's actually yeah. was going to be my yeah. next question. How do you feel over time over the last 30, 40 years that Clark County schools have evolved? What are some of the big changes that you've seen and how have they evolved? One of the things that, um, that we experienced um, uh, while um, I was at Boyce was uh, when Mr. Kellison uh, became superintendent and we started um, uh, participating in the effective schools movement. Uh, that, that really, um, that really uh, was a big change. Uh, we went through the building project, which uh, doubled the size of our school, roughly. Um, it moved our um, uh, attendance area from Cincinnati Road to Warren County uh, to Route 7 to Warren County. If the uh, youngsters were on the uh, uh, south side of the uh, Route 7. And... Um, um, the, um, when we started uh, looking at um, school organization, Mr. Kellison uh, got us interested in this and started um, working with the effective schools. And Brenda was our effective schools uh, chairperson. We called it the best committee, Boyce Elementary School Team. And um, it was a wonderful, uh, a wonderful opportunity. Uh, the, Researchers in uh, some of these universities up in the Midwest, um, uh, they were they were concerned that that um, uh, rising costs of uh, education and um, uh, th things were really hurting uh, some schools. And it, when it came to looking at the schools. Um, you could find a, a school that uh, was out in the middle of nowhere that everything seemed to be clicking. The parents were involved, the students were learning, uh, the community was supportive, and um, it didn't matter whether where that school was located. It might have been out in the middle of the country. It could have been in uh, the center of a city, um, but something about the school was just working. And so they started identifying these schools and um, finding out what in the world they had in common. And so through their study, they came up with um, uh, some correlates. Uh, one was a, a strong uh, educational leader. Uh, uh, one was um, a supportive um, community. Uh, and... Um, they took, there were about uh, different numbers of, depending on which researcher you were um, referring to, but uh, uh, we took those uh, correlates. We had, uh, I believe, seven of them that we were looking at. Brenda was our uh, chairperson for our um, school committee. And uh, we had um, uh, a committee, and it was all volunteer, the teachers, uh, would volunteer on whichever correlate they wanted to uh, uh, to work with. And um, through that uh, type of organization, everyone was involved. Everyone had an opportunity for input. And we all um, had a way to evaluate how, how we were doing. And um, it was uh, one of the best um, experiences uh, I've had in... 23 years of teaching. Excellent. It was truly a team effort. And then there was the belief system, the belief that all children can learn at high levels. So that was our focus, making every child in our school 
It didn't matter about background or disabilities or none of those types of things. We, we moved forward with educating all children and ex the expectation was that all would learn at high levels. Depending on where they are, we start from that point and we move forward. And it was truly a team effort. Um, that really made the staff, co a cohesive staff, really, because oh, we really? shared ideas, we shared information, we were data-driven. Um, it wasn't just what you thought, it was what you knew based on the data and the research that you did within your building. A fellow from the State Department asked me to uh, go to a school system south of here down the interstate and uh, talk with the principals in that school about um, um, the effective schools movement and how it worked for us and uh, the advantages that it had. And um, I made the presentation to, the, uh, to this group and um, later on we went to lunch and I could overhear them talking. We worked on the system of all volunteer. Everyone volunteered for one of the correlate committees and um, everybody had an opportunity for input and we would report back to uh, the group, you know, during a faculty meeting if, as to how we were doing. And as we sat there uh, eating lunch, I overheard these fellows talking and um, we, we operated through an entirely 100% voluntary system. No one was a designated to be on any one committee. They had a choice. And um, as I heard these fellows talking about how they would work with this system in their schools, they said, that wouldn't work. You can't do that. <laughs> they, they I, I think, felt like they would be losing control, mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. and by letting teachers all volunteer uh, for whatever harsh part of the uh, program that you know that they were uh, concerned about, mm. but it was the the uh, opportunity to work in that system with Mr. Callison and Mr. Overby and uh, was just wonderful. It it worked, I thought, perfectly at the uh, boys' school. Good. We were all they viewed all of us as leaders. And I think that made a difference too. Everybody was valued as a leader, you know, no matter what role you played within the, and, and we also had people on these committees from different parts of the, the school. I mean, we had custodians, we had office people, we have cat, cafeteria workers. They were all a part of the committees that made the school flow. And I think that's what brought us together. Yeah. Definitely. So one more question before we turn it over to the audience to ask some questions <laughs> is what advice would you give to a graduating high school senior in Clark County now? Maybe advice that you wish you could have gotten back in your day or seeing how the schools have evolved and looking at the school system now. Somebody who's gone through the Clark County schools now, what advice would you give them now? You mean advice for, for, for their future? Is, yes. Is that what you meant? Yes, advice for their future, yes. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, what's the future going to be like? That's true. Yeah, no. That's true. It depends on what questions the person had, I think. That's I wouldn't <laughs> wager a guess. That's true. Well, I, I, how about a better question? What advice would you give to parents who just moved to Clark County that are looking to put their children in the schools in Clark County? What advice would you give to them? Uh, it, Become involved. Go to school and don't take a vacation in the middle of the year. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, 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 uh, as, as a high school teacher and a principal, uh, you have five or six percent of your students out. Mm. Some places I had, I read recently, had a third of the students out of school in any time. I couldn't see how you can operate. You couldn't operate a business if 30 employees are not there. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's another story. Uh, I, we always thought that school should be your first priority. You want to go to the, the beach in January mm -hmm. in Florida, but 
that's that's not what you're about. And uh, I think a lot of times people forget that if that child misses a week, somebody has to make that up. They miss, maybe they missed an exam, and the school board expects the teacher to make out a separate exam for that one student, and there's five or six others that may have missed. And that's a huge burden on the school and on the teacher, especially when you have students that are absent. And to take students out and have to go on to skiing trips, I think that's pretty ridiculous. They need to be in school. That's their job for 180 days. They can certainly make, make 180 days out of it. I think it's, it's so critical for um, parents to be involved in their child's education at every level. And I think we talk about teachers and students building relationships that relationship should extend to the families and the parents of the children because we're all a team working for uh, these children to be successful in school. And teachers can't do it without the parent support. They just can't do it. I mean, you have them for a few hours and then they go home. So you need to extend what you're trying to do into the home by sharing and working with parents, teaching parents, um, ways in which they can help support their child and the school in order to make the whole process successful. I think that that's critical. The home school connection mm -hmm. means everything. Mm -hmm. And community. I can't leave that out to the community as well because you need community support. John is looking at you. <laughs> Any advice for parents coming in? We had s wonderful parents there at Boyce. Um, uh, one of the first activities after I uh, started there, um, the uh, parents wanted to do a, um, uh, a breakfast. And um, so in conjunction with that, they had a bike-a-thon. Well, I say bike-a-thon. It was... Um, a circuit that the kids could ride on uh, around the country. But back in those days, the traffic wasn't nearly as bad as it is now. <laughs> Wouldn't be safe now. But um, uh, the um, uh, the older boys and girls had their bicycles, but I thought, well, what in the world about the kindergarten and younger ones? It's not safe for them to be out on the road. So, so I set up a uh, track uh, with chalk lines so that they could bring their bicycles uh, and uh, tricycles there, uh, not bicycles on that, uh, their uh, tricycles and what do they call them, uh, big wheels. And uh, they had their own circuit that they could run on. But um, the, um, the involvement of the parents uh, and cooperation with the teachers is just essential. It, that, uh, that was one of the things that I really appreciated about the Boyce community. Uh, if there was some school activity uh, in the in the um, in the future, boy, they were there to check to see what they could do to help. Um, uh, we had a retired um, uh, school principal um, from the Fairfax County system who lived down by the river, and um, uh, he was continually helping us uh, and. Um, uh, it was just that type of uh, volunteerism and, and assistance that really made the difference. Well, Dave, this, this uh, Nathan, excuse mm -hmm. me, this is uh, budget time, and people here are interested in education or they wouldn't be here. And it's good to remember uh, that schools now uh, have uh, responsibilities that they didn't have years ago. For instance, when I was in school, we had the teacher and the principal. And if it was a small school, the principal might teach some as well. There was no school librarian. There was no music teacher. There was no art teacher. There was no guidance counselor or psychologist or anything like that. Uh, if a child was uh, handicapped and couldn't be in school, he'd be at home. And so you have uh, kindergarten now and they have special education. And a huge thing in this area is English as a second language. That's a budget, big budget item in itself, in, in some schools more than others. And uh, there's just been p piles of uh, responsibilities put on the schools. People will send their children to school with the 
but the pills they're supposed to take when they're getting over with the flu or whatever they had and expect the school to administer this, the pills to them. That didn't cause a problem, I could tell you about, but <laughs> it's, uh, they just have a lot more. And a, and a school nurse, we, we didn't have any school nurse. If you were sick, you went home. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was bare bones, so to speak. Mm. And my wife started teaching uh, in her home county. She had 40 in her class. Uh, and that was not unusual at that time. Now now you're, you go for 22 or 3 maybe. Mm. So all that causes the expenses to go up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the demands that people put on the schools. And if you want to demand that, you have to pay for it. That reminds me of the first uh, teaching position I had. We uh, were a country school that had been an old uh, high, country high school at one time, but when they consolidated into a larger system, into the it, this was in Clovis, New Mexico, and um, uh, the the youngsters that I had in class, I, I think we had um, I had close to forty, and um, there was no school library then. The library was just a some books along a shelf in the back of the room. But there were so many desks and youngsters in that classroom, no one could get to those books unless the kids got up out of their seats and moved forward so you could uh, get to them. Um, since then, uh, I've not been in a school uh, that has been that crowded. Uh, it's just, there's been more support for buildings. Uh, people have, uh, I think, take it more seriously. Mm -hmm. All right, let's open it up to questions from the audience. What questions does everybody have here? Yes. I have a question for Mr. McEwen. Um, you mentioned that you taught overseas, both in Japan and in Africa. I'm curious how those jobs uh, came about and what those experiences were like for you and how they compare to teaching in the States. Well, um, I graduated from Eastern New Mexico University in, in um, um, well, graduated from high school 57 and then f uh, four years later from uh, university. And at that time, uh, which was uh, uh, 1961, um, everybody seemed to be going to Europe. I thought, boy, I had, I'd like to do that. The more I thought about it, the more I thought, good gravy, save up my money and spend it on a trip. Why not get a job overseas and make your, make your pay for your way as you enjoyed uh, looking around? So I started looking into uh, opportunities to uh, teach overseas. And my goodness, they were all over the place. The military had uh, schools and uh, half a dozen or more countries. Uh, the um, different the fruit packing company. They might have a private school off over in some uh, jungle somewhere. There were the uh, trucial states out in the uh, Pacific. Uh, there were just opportunities all over the place uh, for teachers. And so um, I applied to a few places. And um, the first place, uh, well, being growing up in West Texas and Trying to find an area from there is difficult, you know. To <laughs> I, mean, I, I drove um, uh, 250 miles uh, west to Albuquerque to interview with the military. I drove 300 miles east to Dallas to interview with uh, a fellow from North Africa who um, was with a place called the Oil Company School. And... Um, so the first place I uh, got a letter of response from was a school in Africa. And they said, uh, well, they'd filled all the positions, but I was next in line. If I wanted to be uh, considered, uh, let them know. I did. And, well, the next thing I knew, I got a telegram from uh, the military uh, offering me uh, or uh, giving me a position in Okinawa. And uh, that's where I met uh, this Virginia girl. She, our school consisted, uh, we were only, um, we were on Naha Air Base. We had nothing but uh, Quonset huts for classrooms. Our, our, uh, the office was a larger Quonset hut. The cafeteria was another large Quonset hut. 
but we were the little Quonset huts. And there were only fourth and fifth grade group uh, students at that, that building or in that uh, school. And um, so Winnie and I had gotten, uh, she taught in the Quonset hut right next to mine, and we became um, uh, good friends. And um, one time I was on my motorcycle, I went to this uh, um, club that uh, on, on the air base there for dinner, and Winnie happened to be there uh, by herself. Uh, she and her roommate, uh, roommate since they were old, uh, B-O-Q, um, had a car, and she was in her car. I was there in my motorcycle, um, and it was raining to beat the band, so she invited me uh, uh, to uh, ride with her back to the BOQ, and I'd left the cycle there. And so we started visiting, and it was near the end of the year. I was headed uh, uh, from um, there to North Africa the next year, and... Um, she was going to be uh, staying in Okinawa. We thought, my goodness, it'd be odd not to be together, you know. We'd gotten used to uh, visiting with one another and having a good time. And so, um, by golly, they, uh, we thought, well, we'll get married. <laughs> let's, let's get married uh, next year uh, because she was going, we'd already committed uh, she was going back to Okinawa and I was going to North Africa. Well, once the teachers and the principal's wife heard about that, that did it. They invited a few of us over for dinner, and in the process, the principal's wife said, um, well, that's just stupid. Wait a year? This is the only place you've got mutual friends. You ought to get married right here. Well, boy, howdy. <laughs> that did it. Uh, there was uh, no getting getting out of it then. <laughs> so um, we were married. They changed her orders to accompany me. We spent three weeks in Japan roaming around, uh, picked up a motorcycle that I had uh, ordered and was waiting for me in California at the Oakland Army Terminal. And uh, we um, it's been fun and game since then. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> what other questions do we have? Yes. So this is kind of a current question. How do you all feel about the, the current movement or maybe demand that parents have much more say in the school curriculum? They ought to have had all that say to begin with. I can't understand how in the world our country could uh, get into the position that we're in now. Parents ought to be vitally Im involved in their youngsters' education. I believe parents should be involved, but I also believe that um, it should be about educating children and not and it not be so political. Because when we go down the road of politics, sometimes we we. We see things through a different lens based on who we are, who our what our experiences were about, and what we want for our children. And I think at one time we were educating kids and we didn't have a problem, a big problem, but now it's, it's the censorship of a lot of things. I'm not so sure if that's fair. And that's personal. I think uh, a lot of stories should be told because that's a part of history. It may not be their history, but it's other people's history. And when we start Xing out people's histories, it's like, what do you have left? I think we need to encompass as much background information and history as possible so our kids can learn from it and build on it. And I don't think we should let it become a political game for adults at this point. Well, I, I think you need to uh, represent the values of a community after all they're paying you. And But one problem we have now is communities are so diverse, more so than they used to be. I talked with a lady once uh, years ago who had been a high school principal of a small high school in the central part of, of Virginia. 
And she said she had one rule for the entire student body. And that rule was you will always conduct yourselves as ladies and gentlemen. That was it. Didn't say be, you know, either late to class or late to school or something like that. But everybody in that community knew exactly what that meant. They all went to the same churches and, and organizations, and it was a cohesive unit. And uh, everybody felt pretty much the same way, and there wasn't as much diversity as there is today which makes it more difficult for the school to try to meet expectations for the variety of religions and cultures that you might have in a classroom. I think Fairfax County has something like 90 or 100 different uh, languages spoken by students in the schools and makes it much, much more difficult. I guess for me, the key word is respect. And I think it's important that we respect the diversity of all the different cultures that we have in America, because we do, and I think we need to learn about each other's culture and, and understand it in order to live together, grow together, and make this country what it needs to be. Well, it sounds like a politician. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but I truly feel that way. That's my take on it. <laughs> yes, I saw a question here. Population in Clark County's trains drastically in the, in the last years. When you were going to school in Clark County, what was the population? Of, and that's the population of, of the town, but like the school you went, you went to Clark County High School. How many students went to school there, and how many were in your graduating class? For me, um, gosh, that's going way back. Numbers. <laughs> um, well, granted, there were four, when my son was in high school here, there were five African American students in his class. That just blew me away because when I graduated from Clark County High School, there were, I guess, 20 something, maybe close to 30 in my class, African American students. So that kind of shows you how things have changed. It's just amazing. But, but what, I'm, what I'm trying to go with. How many, you said African Americans, your graduating class, was it like, like I can tell you, when I graduated from high school, our graduating class was big, it had 605. Mm -hmm. So, but it was, that was somewhere else. So where you're at, when we look at Clark County today, when you say, you know, there's 4,000 people in the town, there's 14,000 people in the county, and you, and you go to say, well, what's changed? Is it when you, when you went to, in 1966, were there 50 people in your graduating class, or was there 100 people in your graduating class? And then we can look at that and say, how many are there now? There's 200 or 100 or 300. Just to look at that to give a perspective as mm -hmm. to the way things have changed. We were just a little over 100 in my class. Um, but I, I think it's more than that now. I'm not uh, real sure. I have no idea. Yeah. But it was just a little over 100, and at that point in time, we thought it was big until we would look at our neighboring schools, and they had 200, 300, 400 kids graduating. But our classes were small then. But it grew over time because the population yeah, yeah, yeah. grew. That's, that's uh, a perspective to look at yeah. as to where Clark County's come from. Right. You know, as it, as mm -hmm. it's grown. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What other questions do we have? Yes. All right, so give me a specific question out of that now. How about we start with these, um, we'll start with the latter part of that. When do you remember the transition from appointed school board members to elected? There used to be an organization called the School Trustee uh, Board, and it was made up of three people, and that was their job was to appoint people to the school board. And that was the way it was in most of the state. But that transitioned, uh, John, what was that, in the 70s? 
in Clark County so. when we had elected school boards? Yeah, I think so. I'm, I'm, that answers one of your questions. I'm not sure what your other questions. Uh, well, the other corollary to that question is, um, did you notice any difference in how the campus, the school board was to the needs of you as administrators um, for um, support at the classroom size or actual capital improvement at building your mansions? Um, was there any difference from when the um, members transitioned to becoming elected as compared to when you were appointed? I think during my time they were always appointed, so I don't know how to answer that question. I don't know. Um, but they haven't been elected that long, have mm -hmm. they? I don't think it's they've been elected that long. I can't. I can't remember. But um, I don't know. I don't know. We're That's not, a good get, question, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're not to giving you good research. answers because I'm not sure what the specific question is. If well, if, if um, that was any change in the support of the school systems. I didn't. I didn't see any, any massive change in it. Um, one reason for me asking is I, I used to live over the mountain in Raleigh, and I um, participated in uh, getting the final uh, ballot for a November election for Raleigh voters to support the transition from appointed school officials on the board to elected ones, mm -hmm. and um, it was through. Changing the district um, representation because of the concentration of the population. So there was an expansion of the board as a direct result of the election. Uh, and then it does become a bit more political because people have to really listen to their constituents at that point as opposed to maybe being more um, responsive to the administration of the, of the school system or maybe the citizens being the Board selected and then um, in the early transition of parliament tended to be very responsive to what the citizens wanted and then you know fight the administration and I get the sense that um, here in Clark County there was um, much more amicable working strong working relationship with the board um, would you say that that was the case I would I'm just from what I read in the paper I'm, I'm not uh, that connected with it I don't see much animosity there. What other questions do we have? Any more? Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's have a big round of our applause for our speakers today. And again, thank you to everyone for being here. And for those of you who've come to the other lecture series, uh, please check out the Barnes Rose Hill, Clark County Historical Association, and Berryville 225th Commission. See all the great events we've got coming up. And we're always looking for volunteers. So anybody who's interested, please come search us out. We've always got some, we're always looking for your help. So thank you again. And if you've got any further questions for us, please come up and talk to us afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.